all eyes were focused on the woman seated at the head of the table. Candles placed around the walls illuminated the bejeweled figure of Madame Stella. The silence of the room was broken by the medium's words. Oh, spirits of the other world, we request that you show yourselves. We, the living, wish to communicate with you. Each person at the table sat still as they heard the medium's words. Then a woman seated at the opposite end of the table from the medium turned to the man seated beside her and reached for his hand. Do you really think Aunt Mary will appear? Her whisper was inaudible except to her partner. I've known Madame Stella for several years and I strongly believe in her psychic abilities. Her companion wore a dinner suit and his handsome features were accentuated by a neatly clipped moustache. He leaned closer to whisper in the lady's ear. I've seen some strange things in my line of work, Doris. If your aunt were to appear here now, I think I should be only slightly surprised. The man's eyes had a twinkle in them, but that twinkle was for Doris, and her quick smile showed that she was comforted. Less obvious in her companion's expression was a skepticism born from a down-to-earth belief that seeing was believing. Their whispered dialogue was interrupted by Madame Stella's voice. We ask once more, O oh spirits of the other world, that you show yourselves. There are those amongst us who would communicate with you. Silence. The candlelight in the room had been soft and steady, but now it changed. Even though there was no discernible current in the air, the flames began to flicker and shadows played around the room. The people at the table seemed to shrink closer to each other, and even Madame Stella grew pale. Several feet away from the table, a haze began to form in the air. Soft and transparent at first, the radiance grew brighter. It moved from a faint yellow to a deep red, and finally metamorphosed into a fiery orange outlined with bright blue. The phosphorescence reached a height of six feet and appeared humanoid in shape. A woman screamed. A man across from her fainted and fell backwards in his chair. Panic seized the group. The fiery orange figure remained where it had appeared, but appeared to turn in response to the noises made by the frightened guests. As terror and confusion escalated, Doris's companion quickly rose from his seat, drawing her with him. His voice barked out to the party. Everyone stay calm. Move over here and stand behind me. Someone bring that poor fellow on the floor over here. His commanding voice had its effect, and with furtive glances at the ghostly form, the terrified guests hastily grouped behind him. Madame Stella, no longer the mistress of this seance, trembled with fear. The glow emanating from the apparition added to the wildly flickering light from the candle, and the room swam with a kaleidoscopic display of colours. The strange figure moved uncertainly, as though it was searching for something. Suddenly the form began to fade, the bright orange absorbed the blue, the shape became amorphous and it faded away into invisibility. The candle flames became still and the interior of the room returned to tranquility, apart from the frightened mutterings of the guests. The man who had taken charge turned to the group and spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, we appear to be safe. Whatever just appeared seems to have gone. I see that our companion has regained consciousness. I believe that a swift return to our homes and perhaps a small nip of something before turning in will see us all back to normal in the morning. One of the ladies spoke up in a tremulous voice. But what was it, sir? Madam, I honestly have no idea. But believe me, I've seen far stranger things in the course of my work. Perhaps we might best ask Madam Stella what we've just experienced. He looked for the face of the medium among the group. The man who had roused from his faint suddenly exclaimed and pointed to the floor at the rear of the group. The organizer of the seance lay unconscious on the floor. Blimey! She's fainted away herself! Earlier that evening, a couple was returning home from a night on the town. John and Felicity had enjoyed the chance to forget about their day jobs, and now the young man was escorting his girlfriend home. Walking the well-lit streets, they observed other strolling couples and a local Bobby walking his beat. As they turned into Felicity Street and walked past the avenue of trees and rows of lamps, they found themselves alone. The evening was silent, save for the muted roar of the city in the distance. Pausing at the front door of the apartment block, Felicity felt in her handbag for the door key. John stood waiting expectantly beside her, glancing around casually and looking along the street. 
John's attention was suddenly attracted by a strange glow nearby. What puzzled him was that this light was not coming from a street lamp, but was apparently suspended above the middle of the road. There were no vehicles in sight, and John's military experience promptly put him on alert. The lamps lining the thoroughfare now began to flicker and dim, making the strange haze of yellow light more conspicuous. The phosphorescence changed hue, moving from bright red to brilliant orange. The light now slowly assumed a shape, and it seemed to be a human form. Hearing an exclamation from her boyfriend, Felicity came to his side, and together they watched the eerie object. John whispered to her, Stay close to me, darling. I don't know what we're seeing here, but my experience has taught me to be cautious around things like this. Within minutes, they could see more glowing forms appearing along the street. As the figures gained shape, they began to converge on the couple. John and Felicity were almost hypnotized by the strange phenomenon, but John snapped to alert. Okay, Flick, get ready to move with me when I say, we're not going to let these things get us. The terrified couple were on the verge of flight, when without warning, the figures began to dissolve into nothingness. Within seconds, the illumination of the street lamps returned. It was as though nothing had happened. John, what were they? I've never seen anything like them in my life, said the young woman in a tremulous voice. Don't worry, sweetheart, I think we're safe now. But I have to admit that I've never seen anything like them before, either. There is one man I know who would probably know what they were, but we haven't seen him at HQ for a while. First thing tomorrow, I'm going to tell the brig about what we just saw. John saw Felicity safely inside her apartment and then he quickly headed home. The following morning, Unit HQ was a hive of activity. The office staff was busy with a seemingly endless stream of telephone calls, and the brigadier was working to stay abreast of an emergency that had been developing overnight. Corporal Carol Bell had answered the latest phone call and now spoke to the brigadier. Sir, I have Geneva on the line. Very good, Corporal, he replied. Put it through to my desk. He was soon occupied in a discussion with his unit superior. Very well, sir. We're on alert here, and we're correlating the sightings in Britain. I'll report back to you as soon as I have more information. Goodbye. Captain Mike Yates entered the room and saluted. So he's loaded the vehicles, and the men are awaiting orders. Good, Captain Yates. How are we going with the sightings, Sergeant Benton? Sergeant John Benton turned from a map of the British Isles on the wall. England was conspicuously studded with numerous coloured markings. So we've had enough reports of sightings now to give us a pretty good idea of frequency. I've used the yellow markers to show where single phantoms have been sighted, blue ones for sightings of several phantoms, and red markers to show where large appearances have happened. The brigadier raised an eyebrow. Mr. Benton, why on earth are you referring to these things as phantoms? We're still in the dark about what these things actually are. Sorry, sir, it's just that... Benton's voice trailed off and he cast his eyes downward. Well, Sergeant, out with it. I don't have time to play guessing games. Well, sir, last night I saw a group of these phantoms. I mean, they didn't look like what I expect ghosts to look like, but I've never seen a ghost before. The sergeant seemed at a loss for words. The brigadier had been rubbing his chin as he listened, and it now appeared that even he had trouble finding something to say. All right, Benton. It might surprise you to hear that I had a similar experience to yours last night. Oddly, I was in a place where one might expect to see ghosts. But I'm not about to assume anything about these things until we've learned more. Captain Yates had been listening in puzzlement at the interchange between his colleagues. Excuse me, sir, but what do we actually know about these sightings? Geneva has just informed me that reports of these apparitions have come in from across Europe, but they appear most numerous in England. Information we've received from the local police and the public here indicates widespread panic. There have been traffic fatalities during the night. These phantoms have been appearing all over the place. But even when just one turns up on a main road, it's disastrous. Vehicles swerving to avoid them and numerous car accidents. By the time emergency services reach the scenes, the apparitions have vanished. People are reluctant to venture out into the roads, and this has caused confusion everywhere. Air traffic has also been halted, since some of these creatures have been turning up on airport runways. Keep in mind that for all their strangeness, these things do have a human shape. Benton turned from his work on the map. Sir, if we're still in the dark about what these uh, phantoms are, what can we do to stop them? That's a good question, Sergeant. And it's one we're going to have to solve. You and I have seen these things up close. What did you make of them? 
Sergeant Benton recollected his encounter of the night before. Well, sir, they didn't seem to be solid as such. They glowed and there was what looked like a blue haze around their bodies. That sounds like St. Hilda's fire, Mike Yates ventured. Their discussion was interrupted by Corporal Bell, who had just finished on the telephone. Sir, I've just had word from the police at Tunbridge Wells. They report that a group of 20 creatures have just appeared in the main street. The brigadier responded quickly. We're going straight there, Captain Yates. Prepare three troop vehicles for immediate departure. We'll leave the remaining men here. There's no telling what or who is behind all this, and we don't want to let our guard down. Corporal Bell, keep me informed of any other major developments whilst we're gone. 